And that is the kind of thing, strategically, we have to deter those, and it's the weakness that invites that aggression. Well, maybe they're focused too much on DEI. There's a concern at the FBI because they're dropping the FBI special agent requirements in the name of DEI. I'm just wondering if that has anything to do with missing an important drone that just killed three of our heroes, Congressman. Yeah, you heard that right in that little clip. We lost three soldiers in Jordan to a drone attack from an Iranian militia group, militia group and Maria Bartiromo is blaming DEI. She's asking the United States Congress to have DEI had something to do with it. But here's where my fury comes from, from that outrageous statement from that horrible, horrible human, because this is who the soldiers were. Watch this clip. Just the last hour, all three killed were members of the Army Reserve. They are 46-year-old Sergeant William Jerome Rivers, Specialist Kennedy L. Sanders, 24 years old, from Georgia, and 23-year-old Specialist Brianna Moffat, 20, uh, also from Georgia. A drone struck the living quarters of the base where some of the troops were sleeping, Eight of the injured had to be evacuated out of Jordan because of the severity of their injuries. That's according to U.S. Central Command. Three black soldiers from Georgia, citizen soldiers, reservists, who volunteered, lived in our communities. They stepped up to serve their country overseas in Jordan. And Maria Bartiromo wants to blame DEI on their deaths. That's why I'm angry. I served 22 years in the United States Army with great Americans of all colors, creeds, races, genders, and disgusting people like that could go on TV and disparage their service. Makes me sick to my stomach. We're gonna talk about this issue. We're gonna talk about a lot of these issues today. I've got a great guest to discuss it with. Let's get on with the show. Oh, man. Welcome, 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 welcome to On Demise, the FP Wellman. I am Fred Wellman, the host of the show. Yeah, that was some clip, right? Uh, that is what we're going into right now. We're seeing this. You know, I always say every week it's been a crazy week. This week was really crazy. I mean, it's gone to a whole new level and not the usual crazy, right? We're seeing this insanity that, that we actually talked about this DI a little bit last week. We were talking to Julia Jeske about Fox News. But man, this week it went to a whole new level. And, and that clip really sent me into a rage okay i'm not gonna lie you know here we are where everything now is around uh, uh, the republicans are tying everything back to the racism um, and if you look at the themes we'll probably talk this week with our guest you know it's the border it's uh Mayorkas, it is everything ties back to these issues that they're trying to cover up even the taylor swift ridiculousness which we'll get to i'm sure is it's got this strange undertone of a vile sexism conspiracy that takes it to a whole new level this week has been really crazy so it really seems Seem like the perfect time to bring a guest who's been discussing the issues issues um, for a while now. So I'm really happy to welcome Kai Von Schroff to the show. Kai Von is a public interest attorney, serves as a press secretary for the youth mobilization nonprofit Dream for America, senior advisor for the Institute for Education, DC nonprofit. Man, you've been around, brother. Every town, gun safety, Hillary Clinton campaign. You're there. Brother Kai Von, it's great to have you on the show, man. Thanks for being here. Great to join. I'm a big fan. Oh, that's great. I love to hear that because, you know, you know, <laughs> here we are doing our thing on the Midas Touch Network. <laughs> so, you know, you saw that. I, I think I sent you that clip. You saw Maria Bartiromo essentially going somehow going from a, an attack on our troops to being a DEI issue at the FBI. Um, it, it really you've been tracking this, this whole concept a lot lately. I mean, where do you take from that? I mean, my gosh, right? Sure. I mean, it's the latest bogeyman that Republicans have trotted out, just like we saw with CRT, yeah. just like we saw with woke. Yeah. It's basically these are all proxies for explicit racism and it's coded language to basically jump on board, say everything you don't like is DEI or CRT. It's always directed at minority groups. Yeah. And it's so transparent at this point. I think what's scarier to me, and this is why I'm so appreciative of Midas Touch Network, is because you there is this right wing media infrastructure that is actually closely aligned with corporate and legacy media. Yeah. And so there is that echo chamber and they covered enough on the right wing blogosphere. And then 
The Wall Street Journal covers it, and then CNN covers it. And who knows, Caitlin Collins, right? She started at the Daily Caller. Maybe that's who she's following on social media. But somehow it gets into the bloodstream of mainstream media. And then you have the Glenn Youngkin type of effect where right. there's all this panic about a fake CRT scandal. And then it turns out, oh, the guy got elected. And now the media is coming around to debunk these lies. Right. So very concerned about that. Yeah, I mean, it is a system. And, and of course, the, the architect, a lot of these things you just, it's funny, the things you just talked about, and including now it's don't forget the transgender hysteria is Christopher right. Rufo down in Florida. I mean, an article came out this week saying that, you know, he's he's been recommending a racist eugenics newsletter and author on his newsletter. Um, you know, Rufo has been an engineer of a lot of this kind of stuff. He's a master. He tells us he, tell, he signals what he's going to do. He says, hey, we're going to we're going to do this thing. <laughs> you know, we're going to we're going to talk about this issue. Um, that engineered anger is something that I know you've been fighting and a lot of the groups you work with have been fighting. And it's it's showing up pretty pretty vividly now. I mean, how, what do you see of the, the, the architecture of this? Well, I mean, and just the great example, Chris Rufo, because he got how many spreads and photo shoots, right. glamour shots in the New York Times, full right. page spreads. And I think what's so ironic is it really reveals the deep insecurity and obsession around education that the right wing has. It's more projection. It's this idea that the left always gets painted as these out of touch, Ivy League elitist. I actually have a piece on MidasTouch.com yeah. about this. Joe Biden is the first president in recent memory to not have a hoity-toity elitist Ivy League degree, right? <laughs> he went to public schools, right. and he should be proud of that. And that's the best of America, I think. But somehow the media doesn't circle back and give him credit. And somehow Ron DeSantis was never called out of touch for going to Yale and Harvard. Somehow Vivek Ramaswamy's never called out of touch for going to Yale and Harvard. Even RFK Jr. went to Harvard. It never comes up. It's only to bash Democrats. So I find that interesting. Chris Rufo is a great example because he, it turns out, basically lied, tried to muddy the waters about having a master's degree from Harvard. He went to the Harvard Extension School. And I would never say this because I think it's obnoxious <laughs> to ever shame someone for pursuing self-betterment, education. I'm all for that. But the reality is, if you want to talk about the decline of merit at Ivy League schools, it's because they have these open admissions, open enrollment, mm -hmm. degree factory schools that are money makers that allow you to get a rubber stamp that says whatever fancy name on it. Yeah. And you know who doesn't recognize credit from the Harvard Extension School? Harvard. Harvard College. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's just ironic that this guy who's saying, oh, the decline of merit in my Harvard degree is less valuable because of DEI. It's like, no, no, no. That's a lie. Yeah, and and he's using it as a, a as a weapon. I mean, he, obviously, he's on the the the, the new school of Florida. Uh, he continues to use these weapons, weaponize these words, and I, I think it does work, right? But and you see in the GOP this threat of racism. And I know you've been talking a lot about Nikki Haley as you're, you're an Indian American yourself. Yeah. You know the, the the whole the tax the irony, the great irony. And you've written several pieces on it. The irony that while Nikki Haley has been defending Trump again, defending the GOP against accusations of racism, it, it of course as it always does. Now she's being attacked with a birther attack herself, right? It's right. it always comes back to haunt you, it's right? So I mean, predictable. It is. <laughs> yeah. And so I mean it. it, it What's your? How do you see her dealing with that? I mean, how does she get where she is at this point? Where she's she's on both sides of this thing now, still in the race, but now she's trying to. It's I've never seen this strange split of reality in one person. She says one thing, but she's facing right. another. It has to fight him. Mean, how does she fight this? And you know, what do you take on that? Well Nikki Haley has always been the flip floppy candidate, right? In the right. one sentence, she's going to tell you Donald Trump's the candidate of, that was right for the time, but that he also got us in $8 trillion of debt and then future generations will never forgive us for that. Right. So it, it, they can't both be true. But I think, you know, she's such an interesting character when you talk about race and identity because she did change her name. She doesn't go by the first name on her birth certificate. She did convert her religion and she did identify as white on her voter registration card in 2001. Now, any of those instances you could take separately and explain away, but you take them together and you add this fact, which is the only thing that bothers me. Otherwise, live your life as you choose to live it. I'm all for that. Right. What bothers me is that she then spends her time with a huge platform gaslighting the American public public about the realities of racism, the fact that she can't acknowledge that slavery was a cause of the Civil War, the main right. cause of the Civil War, right. that she says America was never a racist country, just an outrageous statement that I think even people on her side will acknowledge doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So it's both of those together, that denialism, right? I mean, 
I'm all for it. Your parents decided to give you a more, you know, palatable American sounding nickname to help you get navigate the world. I mean, my name's Kai Von Trock. You don't think I've thought about going by Kai a bunch of times, <laughs> especially in media. I choose not to do that, yeah. but it's up to the person's choice. I think we have to acknowledge though, why in the seventies when Nikki Haley was being raised by immigrant parents in the South, did they make that choice that so many other immigrant families made because yeah. of assimilation, which was the result of discrimination. So yeah. let's get real. Yeah. And and now here we are. Uh, so she's on stage. She's getting a birther attack, you know, having to defend herself from essentially racist attacks. Um, it, it is it is this constant hypocrisy we see in the Republican Party these days. I mean, I, the, one of the big irony things I saw today was uh, Sean Hannity saying that uh, Taylor Swift's been led astray, that you know, that being told that the, the lies that the Republicans are racist. At the same time, you've got these attacks, the BLMs and all these kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know if you saw that um, this really insane story came out this week where a man in Pennsylvania murdered his father. OK, murdered his father, who was a federal employee, beheaded him and put it on YouTube. It's insane. And I'm not going to I didn't link to it. I'm not going to link to anywhere of it. But he went on a tirade on YouTube on these talking points. He talked about DEI. He talked about BLM. Mm. He talked about immigrants. I mean, these MAGA talking points. This hate machine that is obvious to almost everybody is now generating violence. I mean, you're seeing that more violence. I mean, we're in a very dangerous direction, aren't we? We absolutely are, and I think what a great point you make, because I also focus, the, the video was absolutely disturbing. Oh I didn't watch the whole thing, Insane. but I did watch yeah. some of his sort of rant. Yeah. And in the rant, I have to say, if you just watch the clip on DEI, he sounds like every mainstream right winger. He sounds right. like Bill Ackman. He sounds like Elon Musk. You know, you couldn't differentiate that this is a psychopath who just beheaded his father, frankly. And yeah. that's pretty alarming that yeah. that's what this entire group sounds like. And then, of course, you know, Trump has repeatedly called for violence. MAGA is obviously on the brink of that. They don't believe in free and fair elections. They want to take power by any means. They want Trump to be a dictator and on and on and on. It's very scary stuff. Yeah. And now we've got a situation where it's actually being actioned on. We've got this, the latest version of a convoy, which I'm not going to take seriously. <laughs> you know, it's a, but you do have call to arms for these militias. This young man did say, hey, kill federal employees. We have seen actions being taken by these people who are being pushed by this MAGA agenda. And you're right. I watched that video and, and you're, I, I, it was shocking to me if you just watch the portion where he's ranting, you'd never know there's a head sitting on the table in front of him, right? I mean, it really... It, it, it could have been a podcast from anybody else, but there's a there's a bloody head on the table in there. Well, you don't have one, right? <laughs> no, I'm good. Oh, no, this is, I got I'm this. Sorry, I got this a, mug. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to say, you know, part of the other uh, the other angle on that is the idea that why is it that when something like that happens, the entire MAGA group, the entire Republican Party doesn't get painted with the broad brush of here's a psychopath. And by the way, it, it's more d deserving to be because we've had so many instances right. of this, not just, you know, this is a specific case, but how many episodes of violence since the start of Trump's presidency right. in 2017, right? The Charlottesville attack, that is what inspired Joe Biden to run and defend our democracy because that was a turning point for the country and we haven't turned back yet. No. That's such a good point. This is not an isolated incident. And you're right. You're right. If this had been a, a member of the Muslim community, we'd all we'd, we'd be hearing how the Muslim community has to condemn it. You never hear me calling for condemnations from the MAGA movement for the violent aspects of their their movement. And we're seeing more violence. We've seen several of these incidents where there was two police killed. There was, uh, you know, the, the participation in violence. It is getting there's now that we forget the infrastructure attacks that have occurred under these militia, uh, the guys, these militia. And you see active congressmen encouraging it. Right. So sitting members of Congress are part of these movements. These three percenters, uh, and and so, I, I what do you think we face then this year as we go into this very competitive election? Trump's going to be the nominee. I mean, you, you you've been watching this stuff. Do you think we're going to see a lot more of this? I think we could expect to see more, and I hope that the government and, and those whose job it is to protect our democracy are ready and prepared because it was concerning to see some of what went down on January 6th. I think we can all acknowledge. Yeah. By the way, I'll add. I mean, the fact that the judge in the E. Jean Carroll case had to tell that jury, mm. my advice to you, don't ever say you were a juror on this case. That's unusual. I'm an attorney as well. That is not something most judges have to tell juries. Yeah. Why did he have to say it? 
because he knows the reality is there is a violent political cult out there that would endanger the lives of those jurors for doing their duty as part of our justice system. They, you know, they're citizens like the rest of us doing a service, and now their lives are in danger because of Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Right, That's and we're seeing it. Yep, and we're seeing it. We're seeing increasing these swatting attacks. This week, Nikki Haley was swatted, as it turns out. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's it's happening more and more. Uh, it, this is a target. You know, those of us who fight back are being targeted. I was doxxed. Uh, <laughs> I haven't talked about it publicly much because I don't want to be, you know, but my, my stuff got put out there. Right. It's Yeah, it is, it's, it's, it's just am amazing how those of us who are pro-democracy in this movement have been in it for a while. We just sort of accept this. But it's funny. I, 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 it, it hits me. I don't know how to put. I haven't talked about this publicly, but uh, there was a vehicle parked outside my uh, house recently. <laughs> okay, and the police came and chased him off, and and I and I and had to tell my neighbor. You know, I, I, that may have been me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's really an uncomfortable feeling when you're like, just because of what you do, because you're willing to speak up and defend our democracy, that there is a violent undercurrent in, our, in modern America um, that could actually endanger our lives. And when you, it, people talk about it a lot, but when you actually see your name on a website with all your personal information and your your family's personal information, it's it's a, it's a little bit chilling. Uh, and I guess that's the goal, right? It's to chill us, isn't it? Well, exactly. And also, you mentioned I worked for every town. The goal is also to put guns in the hands yeah. of these radical white supremacists. Yeah. And what's so scary about that is I think you and I probably could take a Republican argument any day of the week and chew it up. Yeah. And we could also, as we've demonstrated again and again, beat Republicans at the ballot box. Yep. And those are the two things they don't accept. They don't want wars of words. They don't want us to make our voices heard in elections. They want violence because they keep losing those other battles. Yeah, and that's and that's the losing battle, right? It's the last bastion of the the losing side. And and I've always wanted to believe these are last gasp efforts. I had Michael Harriet on the show last year, and and I said something about I said something on those lines. I was like, well, Michael, it feels like this is the last gasp of the white supremacist, and you know they're fine. And, and he just, I mean, he just he snuck, he shut me down. <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay. And he's right. He goes, that's that's what we said, you know, after the Civil War. We said that yeah. after you know the Reconstruction. We said that after the KKK. And he goes, we said that after the Civil Rights Act was passed. And that's the last gasp. He goes, you know, he's, he really brought it to me. Like, no, nah, you're, you're delusional. <laughs> you know, it's not the last gas. So we, we keep praying this is the last gas, but this continues and, uh, and we're not making the progress we should be. It's incredibly frustrating. Well, even to the point of DEI and the conversation we were having, right? Yeah. The fact that it's a conversation we're having, which is totally valid because it is in the news, yeah. but the fact it's such a mainstream topic when, let me give you just some facts, right? Yep. The reality is, as of last year, there was one, at the end of the year, two Black women CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. So that's two out of 500. Jesus. If you go look at the faculty of Harvard, the tenured faculty, you will be stunned. As of 2022, there were two black, I know we both went to the Harvard Kennedy School, yep. two black tenured faculty members at the school of hundreds, right? I mean, these examples, one black president, right, drives the entire country crazy. Yeah. These are very small measures of progress that have led to such an outsized racist backlash that has really really been mainstreamed and normalized by even folks who, I hate to say it, mean really well, but have just totally missed the mark. And I think of, you know, maybe doesn't even mean that well, someone like Jamie Dimon, who has a massive platform and is going to get up there and say, the problem with the country today, right now, is that Trump was right on China. I mean, a ridiculous thing for someone with so much access to information who knows better to say. And that the real problem is that in 2016, Hillary Clinton said basket of deplorables. In yeah. 2023, 2024. Yeah. Now, that's his main gripe. He, by the way, he'll never mention the guy that beheaded his dad and went on a crazy Joe Biden rant. That's who he says we should respect. The problem is we don't respect people like that enough. According to Jamie Dimon. Yeah. And these I are mean, the, that's a, that's impossible. People always say to me, because I do all this democratic work, <laughs> you know, why are Dems so bad at messaging? It's like, well, you know, sure, are there certain ways that I think they could message better? Do I think somebody like you puts it better maybe than, you know, some politician's press secretary from time to time? Probably a lot. Yeah. But the reality is they're also battling institutional media and they're battling these huge powers that have every incentive to work against them. Yeah. That's exactly it. And, and 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 pulling that thread a little bit more, you, you kind of brought it up. And I, I did want to touch on before we went to break that the Trojan horse nature of some of this stuff. Right. And I, I didn't I didn't get back to that. You, know, you mentioned the, the folks like Bill Ackman, for example, with the Harvard. And I actually you know, we're both Harvard grads. I went we both went to Kennedy School 15 years apart. But I was kind of shocked how many of my own 
level-headed classmates got sucked into the issues the way they use for example uh, miss gay's plagiarism i'm doing air quotes because i don't <laughs> you know but yeah. really it was a trojan horse right and 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 the, the point was she was black right and and it was it was frustrating to me to see well-meaning people who g would normally agree with us falling into the trap of riding that trojan horse right into battle right i mean i think you wrote on that a little bit it's it is it's very dangerous how good they've gotten at using these trojan horses against us aren't they absolutely and i think again sort of reveals almost an internal bias of this elite group of so-called moderates that they're so inclined to see it that way because the reality is right like imagine if the conversation had been about bill ackman's wife plagiarizing in the exact same ways and worse than right. claudine gay just just a day before just three days before right maybe a whole different outcome could have resulted but the media didn't care enough to actually probe any of that yeah. until it was too late and of course then it was all playing catch up yeah. so i think it's really interesting to see that and then also by the way just want to share this because I was I happened to go up and give a lecture at Harvard mm -hmm. the day that she resigned. Oh wow! And I met with a favorite professor of mine, um, a writing teacher at the Kennedy School, and he said, "Kaivon, there is no way on earth a Harvard student would actually have faced accountability, gotten expelled, gotten disciplined for the sorts of citation oversights we're talking about My with favorite. regard to Claudine Gay." And you know what? That is such a fact checkable thing. Yeah. Why didn't the New York Times go interview 10 writing professors at Harvard? Right. They could have answered that question. They chose not to. They chose to run with the DEI racist stories. They chose to quote Bill Ackman every day and give him, you know, his deranged 2000 word tweets, yeah. you know, all this airtime. So it's, it's, an, it's a very uphill battle for liberals. You're battling Bill Ackman, who has millions of followers and billions of dollars. Elon Musk, who owns a social media platform based on driving disinformation against the Biden administration. Yeah. You have the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, who I think it's fair to say biased against the Biden administration, certainly biased against Hillary Clinton back then. Yeah. So all of that, and then we have to fight the Republicans. So it's really a tough challenge. Yeah, and and, and still do it in the right way, right? Still be on the on the right, right. side of the moral compass. Uh, and that's always the problem, right? And that's, it's easy to fight their way, but then we become them. And, and that's yeah, it always matters how you win. I it matters totally how agree. you win. And it sucks. And I get frustrated. I get frustrated with myself as an old soldier, but there are rules. And, and again, we don't want to be standing on the ashes. We want to be standing on the hill. With that, let's, we got some great sponsors. We got a new sponsor this week. Green Chef's joining the show. So let's take a break for our sponsors. Okay, everyone. It's time to elevate your everyday wellness with the number one meal kit for clean eating. Discover new gut friendly recipes each week from Green Chef. Now, each week, choose from 80 plus flavor packed options, including new calorie smart recipes and wellness bundles. Now, easily customize your meals to suit your lifestyle with preferences like keto, plant-based, Mediterranean, gut and brain health, calorie smart, quick and easy, protein packed, and gluten-free. Now, with Green Chef, you can nourish your body with chef-crafted, nutritionist-approved recipes, packed with clean ingredients that support your healthy lifestyle and taste great, too. Now, Green Chef delivers everything you need to make convenient, wholesome, and delicious meals directly to your doorstep. It's time for you to take back your time in the kitchen with dinner in 30 minutes or lunch in 10. Green Chef offers unique farm fresh ingredients like figs, dates, and artichokes, sustainably sourced seafood, and more. I got to tell you, my absolute favorite dish, I'm a big turkey guy, is their creamy turkey bolognese. I mean, trust me, you got to try it, okay? Now go to greenchef.com slash 60fred and use 60fred to get 60% off plus 20% off your first two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60fred. Use code 60fred to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. And now it's time for a brief lesson on the history of toilet paper. You know, the first perforated toilet paper rolls were introduced in 1890, but it wasn't until 1930 that we officially had splinter-free tissue. Prior to that, people just used what was on hand, and oh my gosh, corn cobs, parchment, and even pages from the farmer's almanac. Nowadays, we're clear-cutting our farce just to make something we use just once and flushed on the toilet. And that's why I love real paper. Real makes a sustainable toilet paper that contains no trees and instead uses 100% bamboo. Now, Real's paper is certified by the Forest Stewardship Council, meaning that they are responsibly harvesting the bamboo grass that's used for their paper. And while other conventional tree-based papers are wrapped in plastic in the grocery aisle, Real Paper's packaging is plastic-free, compostable, and offers free shipping on all orders. But here's the best part. When I use Real, it doesn't feel like I'm sacrificing something to help the earth. In fact, it feels like an upgrade. 
It truly has become my go-to TV. Now, Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping in 100% recyclable, plastic-free packaging. So, here it is. If you head to realpaper.com slash Fred and sign up for a subscription using my code Fred at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash Fred. Or write your promo code Fred to get 30% off your order free shipping. Let's stop flushing our forest. Try real papers. Tree free paper. Real is paper for the planet. Man, it's great. So uh, that's a great conversation. I want let's move to some other topics because like, there's a lot going on in the country right now. I just want I want to take advantage of you being here to talk about some other <laughs> ones. You know, one of the things I'm and it does actually go to what we were just talking about. The the House GOP has just sent this impeachment, this ridiculous impeachment of Homeland Security Mayorkas to the full house. Who knows it's gonna I don't know if they have the votes, to be honest with you. But at the same time, we've got this Texas standoff. We've got new convoys going to Texas. I mean, um the uh, clearly they've made a conscious decision that the border is going to be the theme and immigration is going to be the theme uh, for Trump's re-election. I mean, it is. This is a Trump re-election campaign, isn't it? Let's just say it didn't work out too well for Texas last time. But <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. right. Well, <laughs> well it, absolutely, it's going to be a theme of the campaign, but yeah. I actually think, and I know the editor uh, for Midas wrote a great piece on yeah. this about Demo Ron Filkowski, about taking control of the narrative on immigration and the border crisis. And I, I think it's funny to see that. I'm not giving him full credit because who knows, but a short time after that, right, the Biden yeah. administration, Democrats were out with this bipartisan plan. I'm joking, but I do think it's fair to point out yeah. how um, well Biden has navigated this issue because we're going to see now He's called their bluff. Yep. He said, you want to impeach my guy, but you won't give us the budget or the money to do the work that you're saying he's not doing that's worthy of impeachment. With By the way, you even have right-wing lawyers, even like Alan Dershowitz, I mean, right. who I think it's fair to say is a disgraced right-wing hack at this point, um, you know, saying that there's no merit to this impeachment. By the way, I, I know we're moving on, but just to touch back, <laughs> another plagiarist who's on faculty is an emeritus professor at Harvard. Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz. So there's some hypocrisy there. Yeah. But anyways, no merit, no evidence. And we're seeing this again and again, right? We're seeing it with the Hunter Biden probe. We're right. seeing it. And I think, honestly, I think the media is losing some interest. And also, so are the viewing public. That's why yeah. we're talking about Taylor Swift every day. Because there's it's boring. to the, Again, no evidence. More fake BS that yeah. we're alleging against. Okay, like come, Hunter Biden, I think, did a brilliant job shutting down that nonsense yeah. showing up to capitol hill twice calling the bluff of republicans saying you want to question me here i am ask me and of course they want to do all this stuff behind closed doors so they can come out and lie about it yep and 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 i think that's a great point though and as you were talking it kind of hit me i was like you know what it isn't getting the traction it was that the hunter biden probe is kind of falling apart because they know it's a lie every new witness is screwing them up because they're you know it's it's good you're trying to build it up and, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, just a game, right? You know, it's like, but I you're saw, right. I, I think they're even losing their own audience, aren't they? I mean, I saw earlier this week, Comer was like, oh, all of our witnesses are having trouble remembering the bad things that happened. It's like, <laughs> because they didn't happen. They didn't happen. <laughs> like, yeah. okay. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think even Republicans are mad at him at this point. They're done with him. Like, it's well, like, really it. management this, uh, this production, to say the least. <laughs> it does feel like it lost Fox. You know, I guess we had Juliet on last week, and you know, yeah, you're not seeing the coverage. You know, you don't, you don't see. It. That's that, that's the obsession with the border, and and like the obsession with Taylor Swift. Would you go? You know, which is it, the craziest thing. And I was going to talk about it, but by you know, it's Friday now. I think it's run its course. You know, it, it is just. But you know, for my favorite part of the whole thing, you'll appreciate because you you know work in youth organizing is my favorite part of the whole week was Jack Posobiec that he's he he spoke. He's proposing a a summer tour of the MAGA super stars ted nugent kid rock and i'm not kidding 85 year old john voight <laughs> to actor to swing states this summer to counteract the influence the supposed influence that taylor swift's going to have on the election i mean i literally the question you're going to ask kind of on is dude what the fuck is happening <laughs> is that, you know what i mean it's just insanity right i mean they're well, just losing their mind me up because we do follow them closely dream for america the organization i work with is yeah. a counter to turning point usa right which is that's your jam for, yep sort of during thing and they have this America <laughs> Fest thing and who do they trot out as their number one celebrity Roseanne Barr 
famously popular among Gen Z. Like, I would be shocked if most Gen Zers could tell you who she is, what she's known for, anything. Like, maybe or millennials they even. Yeah. Like, yeah. A cancel culture, quote unquote, victim. Yeah. Right? Like, right. no one knows who this woman is. That's the best they have. And yeah. I think what it really reveals, because they have like $100 million in Coke funding and all these right wing do- mega donors. And it's such a top down effort because there is no organic growth among youth voters with conservative ideologies. Right. So it's being inserted through Prager U in schools. It's all this projection, frankly, that right. they accuse Democrats of. They're actually executing that plan. Right. So it's very interesting to see. This group, by the way, even funds local high school and college student government races. That's how <laughs> intertwined they are in all of this and My how God. big a network they built. And it sounds silly, but I think it really matters because when you look at what happened with school board races in the country over the last two decades, where Republicans did build a robust local network to organize and get people elected to school boards, they were paying attention. Democrats weren't doing that. And then I think run for something. Other groups said, hey, guys, let's pay attention. Let's get some better people on these boards. And we had a sweep in 2023. I think we yeah. beat out every single um, Moms for Liberty candidate. Um, that was running for for the boards. But it makes a difference when you talk about these book bans and our education curriculums. And the fact, by the way, in large part because of the Republican Party, in large part because people like Nikki Haley can't admit that slavery caused the Civil War, one in five young people think that the Holocaust was a myth. Yeah. Up to, according to, you know, recent polling from The Economist. So very concerning to see that. That's terrifying. And and for guys like you who are pros at this organizing and, and, and pushing it, it, it I, I like to say every week when I talk to my like, incredible viewers and, and, and listeners is – you said something key in that conversation, which is you organized, right? I mean, and it, it is, you know, it's, it doesn't happen naturally. We, we do have to counter organize. They've been doing this for a while. They're fighting our level. One of the wonderful things I saw here in, uh, where we live in Missouri was, um, you know, Moms for Liberty publishes who they're, who they're endorsing, which is brilliant. <laughs> they have to. And so organize, the locals, like the sort of the people who are against them, organize themselves into it. Because it's one of those open seat kind of things where there's three mm-hmm. three seats open, every runs is uh, open. And it's great. And that's what happened, that when they organize as a team, the three normies, if you will, they won. <laughs> and and we, they sweat the races. But it's it's key. It's it's groups like yours. It's groups like others who are saying, hey, look, we we can't just sit back and hope. Hope is not a strategy, right? And, and, that's, what, and that's what you guys are doing as you go into this new year, right? Absolutely. And I think, look, like one of the things I'm so proud of for Dream for America is I do think that Gen Z has been painted as a monolith. And even now, when we're talking about the discourse on college campuses and things like that, they get, again, this broad brush that somehow we're holding these college kids to a higher standard than we hold an entire political party and movement to. It's kind of strange. But I think what's more to say is that Every generation goes through, I think, multiple definition points for the cohort, right? Like right. nobody cares what millennials think. 50-year-olds, 45-year-olds who are the older millennials got to define what it meant to be a millennial. Yeah. Somebody who's 35, nobody wants to know what does it mean to be a millennial today. And with our group, it's it was founded by a 16-year-old William He. He's now 17. But their cohort is really the second wave of Gen Z. There's 70 million Gen Zers in America. They're not all the same. So many of them are center-left. They love Joe Biden. They're not buying into the latest viral TikTok with disinformation. They care about the economy. They know that they want to go to college and get an education. They want to have a job after that. They want to be able to invest in a household and a family and all of that stuff. So it's very different than, I think, some of the great activists who I'm not criticizing them in any way, but it tends to be Ivy League, older kids that have defined, that are far left and have defined who it means to be Gen Z. And it's certainly not the case. So I think we we owe this generation a little bit more than, you know, a headline in the New York Daily News. Yeah. And, and Biden has now um, they just fielded a, a youth organizer early, you know, which is fantastic. Right. They're not they're not taking it. It appears to me that the the, the campaign's taking this seriously. They're taking youth organizing and, and, and the youth movement is a, a key part of their campaign. Is that what you're seeing totally. as well? It absolutely too. is. I think they built a coalition of youth groups with yeah. different views, and that's awesome to see. Um, and I think not only do they not take young voters for granted, but there is a narrative out there that I, I, I want to debunk, which is that Joe Biden is hemorrhaging support with these young voters, because what happens online isn't what's happening in the real world. And it's not just my opinion, because we have the data to show that let's talk about the Israel you know, crisis uh, yeah. and some young voters maybe being unhappy with the response. It's a conversation for maybe another day, but the reality is that 
That attack happened October 7th, 2023. Then there was elections all over the country in November of 2023, and young voters turned out, despite the headlines that Biden was hemorrhaging young voters, they turned out to support abortion initiatives, to support issues like cannabis, things that they care about yeah. across the country for high profile candidates and lower profile candidates. So, and then guess what? We saw in New Hampshire, same thing. This narrative about Biden losing support with young voters has persisted for months and months. But so we had that one 2023 data point. Our most recent data point is in New Hampshire, where yeah. he outperformed in the large college towns to his state average, which he won the state by a huge margin, of course, yeah. amazing historic writing campaign. writing campaign. But the fact that he did outperform in those college towns suggests he's more popular with young voters than the average New Hampshire. And so hmm. I think it's kind of, you know, let's look at the data and facts. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the key. Right. And and data, in fact, include that the economy is on its way. We just had reports this week right. that the U.S. economy is the strongest in the world recovering from the uh, the pandemic and, and it projected to keep going. I mean, gas is down. I mean, what was I saw it like 260 here the other day. I mean, it's it's hard to resist the reality you face when you go to put gas in your vehicle at this point. Right. I mean, it's there is a move. The timing is great. But because they put the work in for three years. Right. I mean, and I think you're right. Sure. Youth will see this. Everyone will see this. this. At some point, at some point, the lies can't break through anymore, can they? Well, lies and also media narrative, because who's yeah. at home watching cable news? It's <laughs> right. It, no, it's center yeah. right old white guys, right? right. Who want to get scared about the gas, want to talk about gas prices every day. Yeah. But the reality is Biden did such a good job. And I want to talk about this example because I was on the Clinton campaign. And I think one yeah. of the lessons of that campaign was they did get bogged down by this unfair email story that lasted over a year and sort of did the debrief of, oh, well, did you know that the New York Times only covered Hillary's policies, which she wrote an entire book about 12 right. times? And they covered this email story on the front page 5 million times. But that's not helpful. Doing it in the moment is helpful. And what Biden did so successfully, he didn't get credit for the economy for months and months and months, despite all these economists saying the economy economy is looking good. The economy is looking good. I do cable news interviews all the time. Probably the number one question I got asked is, why are Biden's poll numbers bad on the economy, even if it's good? But he did something so smart. He didn't get credit for lower travel costs, lower turkey costs, lower yeah. gas prices on Thanksgiving. But then he did say, why don't you report the facts to the media? And they got all outraged that, oh my God, you were tagging the media and you said that was bad. <laughs> but that's such BS and it's so dangerous when media does that because yeah. to equate Trump calling the media the enemy of the people right. versus Joe Biden saying, hey, I kind of think the facts don't align with what you're reporting on this one story is completely different. And they really concede a lot and it's nothing good when they equate those two to the media. Mm. But what happened immediately after? You got the headlines, Biden criticized the media. Then you had a little fact check go on. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the narrative shifted very fast within yeah. that same few weeks to, oh, the, the economy is strong. Turns out we did misreport it. Yeah. I mean, they'll never say that, but no. the, the tune changed quite quickly, right? Right. And and, and it's it's just, again, it's it, you can't resist it. It's true. Look, it's never going to be perfect. Every, every, every got their challenges, but wages are up. You know, inflation's down. You know, it, it is it is hard to resist the reality. And we've been seeing this in the show quite a bit. If you, if you ever watch it, I say it all the time. It's like, just have faith. Um, one of my favorite things I say a lot is every time you see a poll that says, if the election was held today, I always say, stop. <laughs> Because it's not. You, know? right, you can now stop talking because you know why? It's not. It's January, right? <laughs> or February at this point. You know, it's it's not today. It's it's nine months from now or eight months from now. A lot can change in politics. Uh and 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 a lot of good is happening. And and, and that that continued good is gonna keep going, hopefully. Um, you know, obviously little well, changes. And my mom has a favorite saying that you're reminding <laughs> me of, which is have faith, but tie your camel. You still gotta <laughs> take practical steps. You gotta, yeah. you know, do right. the work. Everybody's gotta throw everything we have at the wall right now. Right. Right. until this election to make sure that our democracy is protected. Because the number of times I go home, I'm from Westchester suburbs, um, and you know, I get asked, don't you think Joe Biden's too old? Or I'm really nervous about the election. Don't you think, do you think he's gonna win? It's like, how about instead of you ask me for the 500th time if Joe Biden's too old, <laughs> you talk about the economy. Right. You talk about the record work he's done on behalf of young people to fight climate change, to open the first ever gun violence prevention office, yep. big issue, you know, to protect Roe v. Wade, which is, you know, obviously a huge issue. Why don't you talk about any of those things? Or why don't you talk about Donald Trump's 91 counts? You know, like there's so many choices people make every day. And I think they, they do fall victim to that toxic cable news cycle that feeds off their anxiety of, 
Joe Biden's old, Joe Biden's old, Joe Biden's old. Donald Trump's old and he drinks 12 Diet Cokes a day and hustles <laughs> down a Big Mac and an overcooked steak. So, you know, I don't exactly think he's like a picture of health bleeding out of his hand on inexplicably, right? Like, Ugh, that was awesome. <laughs> I know. And that's exactly it. Yeah. And, and, and at the same time, this is, and, and switching to that part, which is the counter narrative, which is Donald Trump just is paying $83 million for, you know, for slander, law, you know, defamation. Um, we've got actual criminal cases. I mean, he doesn't actually have the star team. But of that, he said, we just found out he spent $50 million of his PAC's money on legal fees. At the same week we find out he's dropped $50 million of his donated money, we find out that the Republican Party is going to, the RNC is going to ask for a line of credit because they haven't got enough money to execute the campaign. They, they've they been milking their donors for so long that they're running out of milk, right? You know what I mean? And so totally. there is a machine. We're going into this year very, very strong. At the same time, the DNC's got record numbers. Joe Biden's campaign, I think last one was 117 million, right? It's They're, they're rolling at this point, aren't they? Well, also, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I know Joe Biden's doing an amazing job fundraising. Yeah. I've always said, because they used to say he wasn't you know, raising as much as Trump, raising money that goes right out the door to pay your legal bills doesn't help your campaign in any way, no. right? Like, just as a campaign person, no. But number two, I think, why is it that the Joe Biden situation and that he's being anointed when in every other scenario, an incumbent president would be the person who's the nominee and he's incredibly yeah. popular among Democrats. Yeah. And we just saw, right, Dean Phillips, I think, did him the ultimate favor. He said, if you really only care about age, I'm a younger person who agreed with everything Joe Biden did. I have no talent, no experience and nothing else. And um, here I am. And voters said, oh, oh we're good. We're good with Joe Hard Biden. Pass. So good. We're going to write him in, even though he's not on the ballot. So anyways, that's a point. But yeah. Then you hear the RNC wants to crown Donald Trump king yeah. because, what, he can't even win this primary where he's so many double digits ahead? So that gets no media coverage, no backlash. Ronna yeah. McDaniel gets off the hook. There's no accusa accusations of rigging. You're yeah. not getting a political piece every week about how, you know, some random candidate's going to beat Donald Trump. So I think it's, again, an example of a double standard. Well, it is. and uh, But in this case, we're, you know, we're, it's, it's going it's we're going well. I mean, if, if after this first month of the year, I'm not necessarily sure Jamie could have in most ways gone better for the Biden and for the Democrats and the movement, the, the pro-democracy movement. There's threats. There's a lot of threats. And this this border stuff's ridiculous. But I think even average Americans are it's. You know, people worry about immigration and all, but I think yeah, average Americans, it, it still isn't, a, that's, it's not a tabletop issue. If we talk about dinner, dinner table issues, it's not one that's coming up. It really isn't. You know, it's, it's hard to resist well, the tabletop issues at this point. Totally. But, and I'll say this as a pundit, because I think that one thing I try to do, I am younger, I am, you know, a minority. They're often mm -hmm. old white guys that are these pundits and they've yeah. been around for forever. And they're talking about experience they had three decades ago yeah. and projecting it onto something happening in 2024. But let me tell you, Joe Biden, for his age, is so on the pulse of the Democratic Party, including young voters, including minority voters, Kamala Harris as well, big part in this. He was so widely criticized, along with the DNC, for making the choice to move to South Carolina for first in nation. Yeah. And I'm very excited for tomorrow, and I'm excited for the state of South Carolina. I'm excited for our Democratic Party base, yeah. black voters, black women voters, to be acknowledged and honored by our president who is president because they showed up for him in 2020. Yeah. And let me tell you, not only did he not, they said that he was going to come third to lose to Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips in New Hampshire. <laughs> Ludicrous take. He yeah. obviously won over 60% of the vote. So that let's mark that wrong. Let's go find everyone that said that and just put a little <laughs> no in the column. Should we listen to this person for the next year? Right? No. And then guess what? He's also going to double up. Not only did New Hampshire go great and he wasn't even on the ballot, but, oh, that's funny they do that. Um, <laughs> but, but he's also going to get this benefit of launching the campaign in South Carolina, a state that is diverse and speaks to the values of our party. And to, what I love about this as a young person delivers on the promise that he and Kamala Harris made to be a bridge to the next generation of Democratic leaders. And why? Because this is an incumbent primary. Joe Biden's going to be the nominee. It's yeah. not going to matter the scheduling of the primary. But the next cycle... It really will, because yeah. you're going to have a much more diverse state, including more diverse in terms of having rural and urban spaces, even something like that. Yeah. You know, deciding who our nominee is. And that's meaningful. And that's lasting change. Last thing I want to touch on, and I hadn't, you know, I've had the, you mentioned Kamala Harris. You know, I've seen Kamala speak now and say she was recently here in St. Louis for the fall DNC meeting. She's, she's, 
she's hitting it, man. I mean, I mean, she. Is, I think a lot of people dismiss uh, uh, the vice president. I, 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 I've even seen people I, I know well, and who are on our who are Democrats, and they kind of dismiss her. And I'm like, if you haven't seen her lately, if you haven't seen what she's doing, how she's really leading the conversations. Her, her tour of uh, HBCUs last fall was a hit. I mean, she's hitting on all cylinders. I think people are dismissing her too soon. Are you are you seeing that on your side with, with, as a youth activist and and amongst your peers? She seems really kind of hitting hitting on all cylinders right now. Contrary. I, I, overperforming in a lot of ways, which is weird, right? Well, I don't think it's weird at all, actually, because she is a prosecutor, yeah. right? She, she made her name, I think, for a lot of people. I know I've been following her for a long time, big fan, because she's South Asian. Yeah. But, um, you know, in those Senate hearings, that was her skill set, because that she, she does have that background, and she's a pro at campaigning because of that. Those are the moments where she can really prosecute a case, where she can lay out the facts about abortion and what's on the table for women and young women and women of color, right? And she did that so beautifully on The View that even Kayleigh McEnany yeah. went on Fox News, Trump's former press secretary, saying how powerful Kamala Harris is going to be this election cycle, and absolutely she will be. And yeah. by the way, you know what that really plays well into? A digital format where all my generation is going to share those clips on TikTok, on Twitter, et cetera. So she's absolutely an asset. I will say, I do think she gets discounted. She doesn't get her due. Like I saw one Politico article that criticized her as missing the mark. Why? Because she didn't shake Joe Manchin's hand and he appeared offended. But the other comment in the article was, but some people say she raises really insightful questions about inclusion and, you know, marginalized groups in meetings. It's like, well, what would I rather in a vice president? Somebody that kowtows <laughs> to Joe Manchin yeah. or somebody that's raising important questions about inclusion in high level meetings. I yeah. mean, it's a no brainer. Yeah, be a so part of the fight. I think she absolutely gets discounted and this is going to be her moment. I, I agree. I, and, and I think and that's what I saw. And I, I may have been one of those people myself, to be candid with you. I, I just but having seen her now and and watched the evolution in the last three years, you do see that you see someone who gets comfortable with their role, gets comfortable with their voice. And I, I've seen that personally, that that uh, Miss Harris has truly found her. I think she's really found her voice and her place. And they're using her really well. I think she's gonna be very big of a, a powerhouse in this campaign as well. Well, uh, Kai Vaughn, I, I can't thank you enough for joining me. This has been a lot of fun. We've been talking a lot longer. We're close. <laughs> you know, I appreciate it. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, tell us where we can find you. Where can, where can our viewers and our yes, listeners Yes, so I'm find at you? Kai Von Schroff, K-A-I-V-A-N-S-H-R-O-F-F on all social media platforms. You can follow our work at dreamforamerica.org and I'd love to connect online. I love it, man. Well, thanks for joining us, brother. We'll, uh, we'll be talking to you again soon. I guarantee you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, brother. That was a great interview. I, I really enjoyed that. I, I like getting people who are like cable pundits every now and then just to hit like six topics. But a lot of the conversation going back this issue of the DEI, this this thing, you know, it's it is a very serious. It's, we can't discount it. Uh, it is undermining a lot of things, and, and whether it will take off or not. But again, I go back to that opening clip with uh, Marie Bartiromo, essentially blaming the deaths of black soldiers on DEI, and that's just how evil I think. And I'm not even gonna couch that word. It's just how evil and rotten this idea is this 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 very very cleverly couched racism uh that would blame the deaths of soldiers in combat on a you know a policy that's allowing us to get more uh, of a military that reflects our society in the end a military reflects the you know it, that's one of the first things they teach you you know i went to west point as you may know and military science 101 your freshman year and one of the first things i tell you is a volunteer military is a direct reflection of the of the, the society it represents and 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 we have to fight to do that we have to make sure that we do have members of our society in a representative way so that our military when they see our united states soldiers they say okay that's me those are my brothers and sisters in all forms religion race color gender that we have to represent the people and so i get very personally offended and angry when i see those fighting against that limiting our ability to ensure to, because there are barriers to entry for many in our society, whether you like it or not, there are barriers to entry for a million reasons from education, from location, being rural or urban. All these things are barriers. And that's what DEI does. It just allows us to lower those barriers so those who didn't have the opportunities had the opportunities. It doesn't mean they're less, doesn't mean they're less qualified. If you remember last week's show, we opened the discussion, the disgusting accusation by Charlie Kirk that black pilots are somehow less qualified because of DEI. No, the, the standards are the standards. The problem is it's hard for a, maybe a black person to get, get the opportunity to 
fly at all. It's hard for them to get into those schools for reasons because they come from a place that doesn't have the same standards. It doesn't mean their training isn't the same. So I get viscerally angry when I see things like that. That's why I started the show kind of angry because I, having served with incredibly people of all genders, of all you know races, they didn't think twice about it. We knew we went through the training. We were all qualified to be there. And it was, it, it, and that was the whole point. And when I looked over at the left side of my aircraft, the right side of my aircraft, depending on what seat I was flying in, I didn't look at what skin color the person there. I knew what their qualifications were. And we trained a standard. And so it's infuriating to no end to see people attack those great Americans who have stood up to serve and raised their right hand and uh, uh, the, the disgusting accusations that somehow they're not good enough because of the color of their skin. So we have got to get beyond that and we have to fight it. And that goes back to the thing I tell you every week, we have to fight folks. We're gonna fight this. And the only way to win is we cannot sit on our laurels. We have to organize. That's why I'm chairman, as you know, the national chairman, if you've heard me mention before, of Forgotten Democrats. We're ramping up going into the year. I'm so excited. It's our first year. It's our first cycle. So we're still getting up and going. But the Forgotten Democrats, is our goal is to fund these nominees, these Democratic nominees for Congress who just don't get the money or are struggling to make ends meet to take on these Republicans. The 100, what is it, 126 that it ran with an opponent who didn't even raise $200,000 last cycle. 29 are ran unopposed. So we have to fight and we do that by organizing. And if you want to learn more about Forgotten Democrats, it's ForgottenDemocrats.org. I'd love you to go check it out again, ForgottenDemocrats.org. Or you can just text FRED to 33777. That's a that's how you can find, uh, you can get on our email list and find out what we're up to. We're going to have a town hall in a couple of weeks. But I would love you to do that. That's the thing. And that's the one, one of the ways I'm helping. I'm also helping some candidates run for office and whatever I can do uh, beyond just sitting here talking to you. And I ask you to do the same. As always, you can find me on all the social media networks. Of course, I'm still on X at FP Wellman on threads and Instagram is FP Wellman official. I would love you to go and subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is on democracy podcast on YouTube. You can find our shows early there. You can find other stuff, but uh, that's on democracy podcast. And of course, right here in the Midas mighty and the Midas network every Friday night at 11 PM Eastern, man, thanks for joining the show. We appreciate you being a part of this community, this growing community. The shows are still doing incredible numbers because of you guys joining us. Make sure you leave a comment, reply, say hi. See you next week.